Hi, Martin Turner here. In this video, we focus on a way of viewing business and on the accounting rules. We look at what you had to say in the pre-unit survey and then look at double entry accounting. We look at the entity concept and why we use debits and credits and enter everything twice in accounting. Then we look at the accounting equation and the five elements of accounting. Also, we look at the accounting rules, accounting standards and accrual accounting. Let's start by looking at what you had to say in our pre-unit survey. Uh, welcome everyone and welcome to our week two lecture for Act 11059, Accounting, Learning and Online Communication and a way of viewing business and the accounting rules. And we'll be focusing too on assignment one, steps two to five this week in our blog. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, a number of matters. We'll be looking through the pre-unit survey, your responses. Then we'll be having a look at how accounting is a way of viewing business. And we'll be looking at double entry accounting and the elements of accounting. We'll also be having a quick little look at how there's a lot of rules in accounting and then do the minute paper. But before we do that, we're very fortunate to have Marnie McGrath from Evans Edwards here. Marnie is a director and principal of Evans Edwards and she's based in Rockhampton. How are you going, Marnie? Good, Martin, thank you. Thank you for the um, opportunity to come along and have a chat to the students today. As Martin said, I'm one of the principals at Evans Edwards & Associates. We're a chartered accounting firm in Rockhampton. Our, our practice is basically a, a public practice accounting firm. So we work with business clients, um, mum and dads, investors and the like. We assist them assist with their tax returns, with their business affairs and the like. So it's a it's a pretty much equivalent to a you know general practice, general practitioner doctor, um, but in an accounting world where we get to see a whole raft of various different things. So Evans Edwards has been around for coming on 42 years now in Rockhampton we've been operating. I've been with the firm coming on 28 of those. So I'm a spring chicken and, and actually did my university degree out at um, CQU. I guess today, I mean, by the way, throw some questions at me in the chat. Um, I only really want to have a chat to you for a few minutes about what it is that we look for in accountants when, when we're looking to sort of recruit um, either graduate accountants. So when, when you finished your, your undergraduate degree or often we like to look at, um, you know, maybe juggling a part-time um, study load and a part-time workload, so that you can get some real-world experience while you're doing while you're doing your degree. So, when I first was sort of sitting there going, "What am I going to do with the rest of my life, Shannon?" I went, "Geez, I love numbers. I might go and be an accountant." And uh, I could get all the adding up to work and that was a pretty good head start. And it wasn't until I was quite a way into my career, well after university, that I realised um, it's all about people and not numbers. And I'll be perfectly honest, the communication subjects were my least favourite at university because they were grey. Um, they weren't sort of black and white and there was no real correct answer. So what we really are looking for in, in our graduates is really strong communication skills, both written and verbal, because we find that that's important when, when we're talking not only to our colleagues, to our clients, we're always talking to different people. We may need to be on the phone with the tax office or other, or other government departments. So those communication skills are really, really important. And, and probably the other key thing that we look for in, in our graduates that we, we look to employ is just that questioning mind. Um, it might sound a little silly, but it's really imperative for me that the people that we're working with really know how to sort of analyse and question what's going on and, and are not afraid to put their hand up and ask, ask for some help. So... Um, biggest question is why and you know if you can understand why you're doing something and, and what you're trying to achieve from doing that it certainly makes it a lot easier so I guess they're the two key things that that I'm looking for in a graduate accountant 
is, is that a communication ability and that, that questioning mind and that aptitude to learning and, and seeking out new knowledge. Because despite having done this now for <clears throat> well over 30 something years, I hate to count them, um, I, I, you're always learning. There's always learnings. There's always new stuff that we're learning in public practice accounting and in, in general. So I think having that questioning mind will, will always set you up for, for success at whatever you choose to do. What questions would you like to ask Marnie? Least favourite thing about it. Your least favourite thing. Okay, what's your least favourite thing about accounting? When I can't get it to add up. When you can't get it to is, add up. Yeah, there are times when it's just challenging when you're just look at it, looking at a task and you're just going, I can't find a solution for this. I found um, the best approach for me when that comes is I walk away. Honestly, I sit, take a break. I might put that job down and come back to it um, tomorrow. So the, it, it's, not, it's probably, Kayla, not being able to find solutions for my clients is is probably there, I'd sum it up. So it's not my least favourite thing about accounting so much as it is about the role that I do. Um, so, yeah, it's more about not being able to find some solutions for my clients. So they'll present me with a challenge around their tax position and that, and if I can't offer them something, I'm not real happy with that. So I tend to put it aside and... Uh, come back a little bit later when I've had some clear thinking time on it. Things I wish I knew before starting accounting, how important the people are, I guess, Moy. I guess, you know, I sort of, as I said in my intro, I, I started this job because I loved the numbers. I still love the numbers. I could sit here and do them um, and still get reward out of doing the numbers side of things. But the most important thing for me in the learning that I've had is that, that we really are all about people. So as a public practice accountant, we're in a, I feel I'm in a very privileged position because I have really good client relationships um, after you've worked with them for a while. They'll come and ask you all sorts of questions that you think, this has got nothing at all to do with your, your numbers or your, your business numbers or your tax position. But they see you as that, that a trusted advisor and it sounds a little cliche, but they do start to turn to you for that advice. And I think, you know, developing those client relationships and those people skills earlier in my career would have really, you know, helped me. So hopefully I answered both of your questions, Caleb. Um, yet my most favourite thing is the flip side of what's my least favourite thing. So being able to find solutions for my clients that actually makes a difference for them, to see, to get that phone call from them when, they, when they're just so excited about sharing, sharing what they've achieved or, or sharing some news. And yeah, it's quite rewarding when the first person they pick up the phone and ring is me. And I think, wow, oh, I actually have made a difference for that person. That's what I get gives me a buzz. Yeah, funny. I think, Martin, we have certainly seen a big change in, in our profession, being forced to embrace the technology a lot more over the last couple of years since COVID has hit. I don't think that you can do it quite as well online. I know it, it has a lot of benefits and it, and it enables you to get your message out to a broad audience, but I still find that there's nothing nothing more valuable than being able to sit across the table from a client um, in a face-to-face -face communication because you, you get so much from their non-verbals as well yeah yeah and do you find that you're sort of talking to clients face to face but then also doing some online around it oh definitely definitely I'm working with a client at the moment who's undertaking a business purchase and they don't live here in Rockhampton they live out in the uh, Central Highlands in the in the coal fields, and we can we can schedule a Zoom session and you know talk to them two or three times through the week as we need to, and that is it is incredibly more effective than trying to do things via phone and via email, but yeah. I still yeah where you where you can we always like to try and catch up with with the the people in person.
What other questions would you like to ask Marnie? Marnie's been in the game for quite a while and she did her, her accounting study here in regional Queensland in Rockhampton. Actually, Evans Edwards have been giving a prize to, uh, it's really people who come top of a number of subjects uh, each year. And they've been doing that for 40 years, just about it must be, I think. I, I think we are pretty close to that. Yeah, Imogen has asked, what are your primary roles in my position? So as, as one of the directors and principals of our firm, Imogen, my primary role is to um, is twofold. It's to bring new work into the firm. So I br do that by, you know, by attending various networking events, by talking to people in the business community, by working in a, at a high level with some of my clients on those business acquisitions and, and, and that sort of thing. So business acquisition, structuring, taxation advice around that. Uh, that's sort of my primary role from a client facing um, and client point of view. The other aspect of my role is as the business owner and or one of the business owners is to look after my team. So we have um, a team of somewhere around 12 to 15 accountants at various different um, experience levels, as well as an administration and support team spread across an office, our head office in Rockhampton. Uh, we have an office in Yapoon and we also have an office out in Emerald. So the other aspect of my role is to make sure that all, my team have everything that they need, all of the training that they need, all of the resources, all of the development and support that they need because they're integral in, in sort of helping look after um, our clients as well. So I can't do it alone. Um, so yeah, that's the two, two aspects of my role and that business owner leader role is something that you learn as you go. Um, but it's certainly something that is, yeah, very, very important. May Louise has asked me in regards to people who come to you for business advice, do you get more startups or more established businesses? I would Probably say probably more established businesses because that is our key sort of uh, target market in there, May Louise. It's um, we do get a number of startups. However, our target demographic and clients where we focus our marketing effort is not not at that startup level. We have worked closely with the Smart Hub here in Rockhampton over you know, quite a number of years to support some of those startup and entrepreneurial businesses. But I would probably have more of my um, business advice provided to my established business clients. And those new clients to the firm are coming on the back of referrals from existing clients who know what we do, how we work and what sort of advice we can provide to them. So, Sandra, do the rules and regulations change much in accounting, <laughs> <laughs> e.g. tax exemptions, deductions, percentages, and this? So how do you keep up? Do they change frequently? So when we're looking at rules and regulations, I'm going to say not so much in accounting. So pure accounting, where we're doing sets of financial statements and audits, are a completely different part of our practice to where we do a set of financial statements to assist with doing um, clients' tax returns and compliance. Does it change much? Oh, yes. Uh, how do we keep up? Lots of professional development and reading, um, attending seminars, networking with peers, just and, and talking amongst ourselves here. So we have a regular um, training meeting with our staff so that they can keep up to date with any of those changes. Um, it does change quite regularly. This year is going to be particularly exciting for us because we have not only a federal budget um, but a federal election. So that's always fun. First Tuesday in May, we go, woohoo, what are they going to change now? And I think the most changes I saw was obviously COVID, um, April. 2020, I've never seen in my career and hope never to see again the pace of change that we went through as a profession and the level of additional work that 
myself and our team had to go through to keep abreast of those changes because we were supporting all of our clients who were in a fairly very, very difficult position, wanting to know how they were going to navigate um, all of the changes that were coming in and being announced by the government. And it's the only time in my career so far where I've seen rules change from the morning to the lunchtime to the afternoon. That's how quickly it was. What do you think that means for what people should be learning at university? What sort of things would set you up for that sort of environment? That thirst for knowledge, that questioning mind, Martin, it really is something that I don't know all of the answers. I know how to find the answers. And I think if you can approach things with that mindset um, and the fact that um, you, you are going to have to go out and find the answers and fo- know how to find those answers, so that ability to the ability to research, the ability to get through the masses of information that's available out there on the internet um, and and distill that down into something that's meaningful and and be able to, again, then turn that information around so that I can explain it to a client in their terms. They don't want to hear me talking accountant gibberish. Um, they want they want to know what it means in language that they can understand. Access it, analyse it, and then communicate it at, at the level that it needs to be. Tips to deal with so, with so much numbers in accounting. I will always say to our trainee accountants and, and that when we are doing accounting work, um, we're breaking down our task and we're starting and we're following a process. So... If we follow the processes in our accounting and in doing our jobs, so old school way, I'll prepare a a working paper or a a list of how things need to be. From there, that becomes my journal entries and then I post them into my ledgers. So having that process enables me to break the numbers down and I know that before I even start to put the numbers into the financial statements, that I know the answer that I'm going to get. And I've also, what I will say, have left a breadcrumb trail so I can tell the story in my numbers to somebody else that picks up that that working paper or that file to say, where did those numbers come from? Because in public practice accounting, accounting we're often, often working on three, four, five different jobs at, at once at various stages. So you need to be able to follow your own work and make it flow in a logical way so that when you pick it up again in two weeks' time, when the client's brought back the answers to your questions or, or whatnot, you can pick it up and you can say, yes, I, I know where I got that number from um, because it's in a logical way. <laughs> oh, oh, Christine, no, I, I refuse to answer that question. Sorry. Nah, I'm only kidding. Um how does your job affect your general lifestyle? It's a challenge to balance is, is what, you know, and, and that's, that's across the profession. It's something that we focus a lot on with our staff in terms of having, you know, flexible work arrangements in terms of making sure that they don't work excessive amounts of hours because there, there, there is a lot of work that can, and a lot of pressure at times in deadlines. So it's really just being able to manage that yourself to say, I can't, I can't be here for my clients and I can't be here for my team if I'm not looking after myself, you know, outside of work. So I need downtime as well. I need to look after my general health. Um, otherwise, I just can't do my role properly. So hopefully that answers your question. Can't make a comparison. I've never lived and worked in the capital city. I have no real desire to ever to lead that lifestyle along a, a country girl at heart and, and Rockhampton's a big enough for me and we're an hour from Brisbane if I need to be. We've, we've got a beautiful area in central Queensland. I really can't, you know, it's awesome. We can, we can work in the CBD of Rockhampton, for instance, and we're 40 minutes from the beach. I live 25 minutes out of town on a small, small block so it it is great because there are just so many um, so many ways to recharge your batteries without necessarily having to um, deal with the hustle and bustle of the cities. So um, our recruitment strategy is very 
broad in that we we have um, we will be look, we're always looking for good quality graduates. As I said before, even even undergraduate type roles where they might want to balance um, a part time working part time. Um, studying so that they can get some experience as they're doing their degree you know we would look at recruiting you know a senior accountant with you know five to six years post experience so having completed their degree and had some experience not just this not just in public practice accounting but in life in general Um, so yeah it, it really depends on the time as to what we're looking for our biggest um criteria I guess is that they're a good people fit with our team and and we can um yeah see potential for them to go from there so we go through that in our interview process but yeah by all means I'm happy to answer any questions offline after afterwards if someone thinks of a burning question that they wanted to ask you know reach out to Martin and he can pass on you on my contact details that'd be great well thank you very much Marnie for your time you're welcome Okay, right. thank, thank you. you. Well, we'll kick off now on our lecture. We'll be doing, uh, we're going to look at what you had to say in the pre-unit survey. And then we're going to have a look at a way of viewing business, double entry accounting, elements of accounting. We may only get through a bit of that today. We'll see how we go. And accounting rules. And then we'll definitely do a minute paper at the end. The pre-unit survey, we asked you, what do you think learning is? was one of the questions. Lots of people completed the pre-unit survey. And what I did was I, I, I um, allocated your responses into one of these six categories. One is a quantitative increase in knowledge. That's thinking that knowledge is adding sort of to the backpack of facts and stuff that we learn. And it's very simplistic sort of way of viewing what learning is because we don't have any particular idea what we're going to do with it. We're just sort of, just sort of getting quantity of, of, of facts. The second is a slightly more complex way of thinking about what learning is. It includes a quantitative increase in knowledge, but it also includes memorising it so that you can reproduce it, for example, perhaps in an assessment like an exam. So it's a little bit more complex because we have a purpose for it. Then the third, which includes the first two, but the acquisition of facts and methods is where we, we see learning as applying things we're learning to the real world. So you might be thinking, for example, we learn some things about accounting here that you can apply to the workplace. And so that's a little bit more complex what thinking of learning because you're doing more than just memorising and reproducing, you're actually applying it somewhere. But these first three ways of thinking about what learning is, think of learning as being a sort of passive process of, of getting some facts. There's clear cut facts around there and I'm just sort of, getting hold of them. It's a sort of surface learning. The fourth one is an abstraction of meaning. That's where I'm trying to understand for myself what it means. And, but it's still not connected to the world, but it's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand it for myself. The fifth is an interpretive process aimed at understanding reality. So that's where it's changing the way I view the world. So, for example, with the reason for the seasons, I might learn that as an undergraduate in first year astronomy, say at Harvard, and learn what the the seasons are caused by the sun, Earth being at an angle to the sun, and that angle changes as the Earth goes around the sun in the northern and southern hemispheres. And uh, so that might be a quantitative increase in knowledge. I might memorise it to produce an exam. I might apply it. It might be something that I can apply to, um, uh, you know, I might decide to sort of close the blinds and a north-facing window in winter because the sun's coming in further. The abstraction of meaning, I'm starting to understand how the the earth sort of moves around the sun and and understanding that it's to do with a a different, the earth being in a bit of a tilt and, uh, and sort of understanding how that means. An interpretive process aimed at understanding reality is when I'm looking at the world around me, I see how the sun works and it's sort of moving through the year and, uh, and its angles changing. And changing as a person is where they, I, I'm, I'm a different person through what I've learned. 
So let's see what you had to say about all this. What do you think learning is? Well, I ca characterise 51% of people viewed learning as a quantitative increase in knowledge. So uh, let's just get some facts on board. 6% include that, but have memorising and reproducing. And 30% is, is uh, applying it to the real world, and which includes the first two. So you can see that sort of getting about 90% getting on to 90% of people, particularly one and three, um, view, think of learning as being, you know, quantitative increase in knowledge or a little bit more complex, which is where you apply it, perhaps to a job or to something in the real world. These are all quite limited ways of thinking of what learning is. And, it's, and you'll tend to be, if you think learning is these things, you'll tend to be passive and just want to receive the facts, you know, and do it efficiently. And 7% uh, saw, saw learning, also saw learning as, um, as uh, developing an understanding about it for myself. 1% was to change, was changing the way I view the world and 5% changing as a person. Of course, we've had a look at what those, those uh, conceptions are and there's a, a video on it, which I'll refer to. So we can, change the way we conceive what learning is by understanding there's a little bit more to it than just a quantitative increase in knowledge. We could be learning in more meaningful ways in a formal environment. But just thinking, just conceiving what learning could be and what it is, is different to actually doing it, of course, but it's a necessary first step, really, is to understand that we could be learning in, um, in all sorts of ways in, in the formal environment. So there's this short video, Conceptions of Learning, which I recommend. It's in the intro, unit introduction tile in Moodle. There's various resources there. That's one of them. You should have a look at that Conceptions of Learning video just to go over these six ways that we can think about what learning is. Another question, the pre-unit survey, what year are you in your studies? 88% of people in our unit are in first term first year, just starting out. So if you're like that, you're not alone. And 9% are in first year, but not the first term. So they've started first year and done uh, some units, either third term, second term last year, or even first term last year, and they're, they're still in first year, but it's not the first term. There's 2% year two, and 1% are either in year three or more. So the great bulk of people are in first year, first term. Is English your first language? 81% yes, 19% no. And so a number of people with English that's not their first language are writing very good um, step ones and are very articulate. Um, some people who have English as their first language may not be quite so articulate as that. But if you've got English as your second language or third language and not your first language, then Having the opportunity, for example, with the KCQs, you get lots of opportunities to write in English, talking in English, just developing your English language skills is very important in your degree, particularly if you want to work in a professional environment um, that, has, that speaks English as their primary language. But that's sort of how the split is, sort of 81, 19%. How many units are you studying? 8% is studying one unit, 29% two units, 24% three units, and 39% four units full time. So it's sort of a bit of a mixture here. If you're working full time, my strong recommendation is you do no more than two units in your first term. Most people are in their first term. There's a lot to settle in, you know, you've got to figure out Moodle, you've got to figure out how everything works, all the subjects are a bit different. and um, and you can settle in and then you can reassess. It's a rookie error to do in three or four units in your first term if you're working full time. Particularly also if you've got young kids and some people just have babies and everything, it's better to be a bit more conservative in your first term, settle it down, and then you've got a feeling for what's involved. Um, I don't know how to say that any more strongly, but don't do it to yourself. Um, you can feel a little bit of pressure to try and complete your degree as soon as possible, but it doesn't help if you do too many subjects in your first term and you fail some of them, 
or if you just sort of don't really learn very much out of them because you're too busy trying to squeeze through, that's not going to help you in your degree and into your career. So that's the sort of split. You can see it's spread around a bit amongst two, three, and four, and there's some who are doing one. And um, doing one for in your first term, first year, is not a bad idea just to settle in if you've got lots of other commitments. How much time do you expect to spend each week studying for this unit? 4% said zero to four hours per week, 29% five to eight hours, 36% nine to 11 hours, 12 plus hours, 31%. Research shows that when you ask people this question at the beginning of their unit and then ask them again at the end and go through what time they spent, people invariably have spent quite a bit less time on their studies than they say they expected to at the beginning. So these figures, if uh, you're likely to spend less than this in actual fact. What I've said in the, in the study guide is that the unit is designed that if you want to spend 150 hours of study, it's in the unit. There, there's content and things to do for 150 hours. And that's, that's the government view on what people should spend on each subject they study at unit that's a six-point subject like this. It also said, and so if you're doing 12 weeks um, in a term, then that would be 12 and a half hours a week. Or 10 hours a week if you did the two, if you worked 10 hours a week in the two weeks leading up and also in the study break. I also said that it's possible to get a, a, a good mark like a D or HD if you spend about 100 to 120. You're probably going to have to spend 100, 120 hours in order to get a, a high mark in the unit, which would be sort of that higher end of the nine to 11 hours sort of. So we're sort of nine or 10 hours um, a week for 12 weeks. And if, but to pass, it's very difficult to pass this unit if you don't spend about 70 to 80 hours on it, which um, is uh, sort of seven or eight hours a week over 10, over 12 weeks. So if you're planning to spend naught to four hours, or if you're in the five to eight hours and are likely to spend less than that, you need to reassess your time commitments, how you can fit things in, because you are going to need to be able to do, to do 70 or 88 hours a week to pass the unit. You'll need to divide that by 12. You get sort of, you're going to need six or seven hours um, every week for 12 weeks to do it. So that's what you had to say on that. And how familiar with Excel are you? 6% say they're experts. We usually find there's this group of people in the unit, a fairly small group who are really good at Excel. So if you can get to know some of those people, that's great. And, and they're usually very helpful to share their expertise around. 43% quite comfortable. And these people may have, have done quite a bit of Excel in their jobs at different times, you know, and doing a certain amount of things have used a bit, 46%, which often means not that much. And you might be having to, and you'll have the opportunity to, to strengthen your skills in certain areas, never use 6%. So there's a range of, now with Excel, it's just learning by doing. We, we use Excel in the assessed learning tasks and just by doing things, you'll strengthen your skills, data entry, linking cells between worksheets, all this sort of thing. But there are workshops, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ARC workshops, ALC workshops. Um, and the first one is on Friday, week two this week um, in our term. And uh, you can go to the learning, to the classes and recordings tile in Moodle to click on it and register. And um, that's a great, that one focuses on data entry particularly. And uh, so to help you with certain skills around getting the data in well and, uh, and a few of the other introductory areas of Excel, this is a really good workshop. So for those who are able to go to that one, I strongly encourage you to go. And it'll be just a small group, so you'll be able to get lots of discussion and, and sort out any issues you're having in getting going on Excel. It's not recorded, so it's just for people who are there able to go at the time. And uh, Chen, who runs it, she's also very happy for you to ask her questions and 
and she'll do some consulting and support to you um, to help you get um, to build some of those Excel skills. You need to be good at Excel, obviously, in, um, in business generally, but particularly accounting. How much time? Oh, sorry, wrong way. So that was the pre-unit survey. I find it so interesting reading everything you were saying on all the different areas. And, you know, people talking about what is accounting and, and other things. Um, and it gives me a sense of where everyone's coming from, which is so interesting. Now, double entry accounting, a way of viewing business. This is what accounting is. And uh, this turned out to be a very powerful way of viewing business. Double entry accounting, what's that? It's a system of recording transactions and economic events of a firm to ensure the relationship between elements of a business, uh, elements of the business model that underpins accounting, which is the fundamental accounting equation, the five elements of accounting, is kept intact. So this is a system. It's a system. It's a bit of a nightmare in some ways. It's quite an invention. And it's a way of recording transactions to ensure that that business model that underpins accounting, that the relationship between those five elements of accounting is kept intact. So accounting is this way of viewing business, and it's a way that's proven to be very influential. One thing double entry accounting is not, it is not designed to be a check on data entry. I mean, that would be such a cruel joke if it was, it is so complicated. If we're just doing that to check the data entry, that is not good. And that's a common misconception about why we do double entry accounting. We don't do it to check data entry. It's true that we can pick up some data entry errors um, because it's, you know, because the debits and credits need the balance and we can do a trial balance. If they don't balance, we know there's some errors there. But there are plenty of data entry errors that won't be picked up that way. Say we, say we just um, uh, translate the debits and credits, get them around the wrong way. It'll still balance the trial balance, but there's an error. All sorts of errors, millions of errors of data entry can go in that wouldn't get picked up. So the data double entry accounting is not to check the data entry, it's to ensure that that business model that underpins accounting, the relationship between those five elements of accounting is kept intact. So it's quite a bit of a complicated little animal. So double entry accounting, a systematic recording of transactions. The reason we do accounting this way is largely an historical accident. <laughs> it's because accounting was invented, you know, at least a thousand years ago, a long time ago, when quills and 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 paper, pen and ink and paper, quills and ink and paper and paper were high tech. <laughs> was, they were the latest things, and so it was invented in that context. If account, if we didn't have accounting until today, and then suddenly we decided to invent accounting. We probably invented in a completely different way with our technology today. But it wasn't invented today. It was invented all that time ago. And that was the purpose of the QWERTY example, for example, for, uh, on the typewriter. We had the keys on our computer. You can look at them now. Their design, their design came out of the typewriters. And it was designed that way to stop the little arms that were popped up from the, and the that went onto the paper to type didn't, didn't get caught up. And of course, we don't have little arms anymore on our computer, but we still do it this way. Why do we do that? Well, it's sort of, it would be a huge amount of work to change the keyboard and train everyone on different keyboards for not a lot of benefit. So we keep that as it is. And that's the same with accounting. It's the same with a lot of things. It's extraordinary. When we're born, we don't, we're not born into a world with a blank piece of paper everywhere. We're born into a world with a whole lot of things that have gone on in the past and, and it just keeps going huge number of things that are like that. Pilots in aeroplanes, they always are on the left. Why is that? Why they put the pilot on the left, the co-pilot on the right, these big jets? Well, it's because when the plane started, they had, a, they had a propeller in the front. The propeller went one way, I think it was clockwise, and it went that way. And so they needed to put the pilot on the left to sort of balance the plane out a bit so it didn't sort of spin too much. Well, the jets don't have a propeller in the front anymore. So it doesn't matter, but we still do it because that's the way it's always been. Everyone's got used to the pilot being on the left and, that, and there's no real reason to change it. 
So that's why we do double entry accounting. And journals and ledgers, you can see them in the reading. Journals is where we just put in the entries day by day. Journals, day by day, just as they come. And man, can you have a lot of transactions in business just coming at you? You just think of Coles supermarkets, 800 supermarkets around the country. They've got transactions occurring right now like you wouldn't believe. They're just going in one after the other, just in order. Then that the journal entries are, are then shifted to the ledgers and uh, they, uh, the ledgers are the, are the accounts that um, are the five elements of accounting and all the different examples they have assets and expenses and liabilities and revenue and equity. And that's where the data stays. That's the core of an accounting system. And so the, uh, uh, um, that's like the hard drive, if you like, of the accounting system. And then the trial balance is a list of all those ledger accounts that we have, their balances, debits and credits, just listed down and we can add them all up and see if they balance. And we do that before we then um, put together the financial statements. So as well as double entry accounting, we've got this idea in accounting, the entity concept. This is the one good idea that accounting has had in the last thousand years. This is it. This is the one good idea. What is the entity concept? Well, it's an awareness that the owner or proprietor of a business is separate and distinct from the business itself. In other words, a business is seen as separate to its owners. So you say, well, what's that? Isn't that obvious? Well, no, it wasn't obvious. If you were a blacksmith in a town and you had a blacksmith business, people just saw you as the blacksmith and the blacksmith business as the same thing. It was all just, but accounting doesn't look at it like that. It looks at the owner as being separate to the business. And for example, the separation of the accounting records of a business from the records of the business owner. So a firm is seen as separate to the owner and everything, of, so what that has some consequences. The business is seen as separate. Obviously, if it's a company, it's a separate legal entity, but also if it's a sole trader or partnership, which are not separate legal entities to the owners, accounting still sees them as separate to the owners. And the entity concept has this big impact on accounting. It means that every transaction, that means every transaction of a firm has a dual aspect, has two aspects. Just as a coin has two sides, heads and tails, or there are two sides to a piece of paper, or usually two sides to any argument. Every transaction has two aspects, a debit and a credit, two, a dual effect of transactions. What that means is that every time a business must make at least two changes every time there's a transaction in its assets, liabilities, or equity. Two, at least. The dual effect, because everything a firm does affects itself and its owners. Debits and credits mean something. They're just not meaningless words that someone's made up as a bad joke. Debit is Latin for de beer or to owe. Debit, it's like debt, if you like, to owe. Credit is Latin for credere. It comes from the Latin credere, which means to believe or to entrust. And so if there's an increase in an asset, that's a debit. And why is it a debit? It's because the firm owes an obligation to the owners to manage the assets well and provide a return on it for owners. The firm, the assets have come from the owner and the firm owes an obligation to manage them well, provide a good return on it for its owners. That's, so it's a debit to owe. An increase in equity or liability is a credit. And why is that? It's because someone outside the firm, either a shareholder or a debt holder like a bank, has entrusted or believed in the firm. When my kids were young, when... Um, 
where I'm in healthcare floated. I asked them to give me all their life savings, $900 for two of them and $500 for the four-year-old. I invested them where I'm in healthcare. And my daughter wasn't all that happy about it because she was, what if they don't do a good, you know, this is all my money in the world. So you need to entrust or believe in the firm that equity and liability um, owners, have, uh, providers have to believe or entrust the firm uh, with, with resources. So that's why an increase in equity or liability is a credit. Now, the five elements of accounting. Accounting just looks at five things. It's a business model. It's a simplification of the real world. Businesses have a whole heap of things. Accounting just looks at five things. And accounting views a firm as having just these five elements. Assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses. Assets. You, you need to understand these definitions. If you've studied accounting at high school or somewhere, forget about what you did at high school. Often you learn that assets are something you own or something like that. Forget about all that. That's not helpful. Assets are a present economic resource controlled by firms, you know, their own, but they're not, that's where the control bit, but they're a present economic resource controlled by a firm that has the potential to produce economic benefits. That is, it has the potential to add value to a firm in the future. So it's a present economic resource. A friend of mine runs Coffee Supreme. It's run in New Zealand and Melbourne area, also in Tokyo. And they have these little silver delivery vans the firm owns. It makes coffee and then the vans deliver it around the coffee shops. These delivery vans are assets of the firm. Why is that? It's because these delivery vans, they're a present resource that they have that have the potential to produce economic benefits to Coffee Supreme. And what's their potential? Well, they can transport products to customers in the future. Now, a particular truck might just stay there and never do anything. So you, you don't know, it might just sort of blow up and be hopeless, but it has the potential. They all have the potential, and these vans invariably do, transport products to their customers. That's what an asset is. You should write these various definitions down, write them down 40 times, and you'll remember them for the rest of your life. What's a liability? It's a present obligation. Assets are present resource, a present obligation of a firm to transfer an economic resource that a firm has no practical ability to avoid. You don't have to have a legal obligation. It can be a, it's just something you, it, no, practically you have no ability to avoid. You might have a policy or a practice or that customers might have an expectation, for example, that you give refunds. So liability is a present obligation of a firm to transfer an economic resource. For example, Coffee Supreme, they buy coffee from Brazil. They may have promised to pay $50,000 in two months to a firm in Brazil that has recently supplied it with raw coffee beans. A present obligation to transfer an economic resource um, that it has no practical ability to avoid. Equity claims of owners in a business. And the value of the interests of owners in a business, based on our business reality, this equity will always equal assets less liabilities. It doesn't have to be. We could view things differently and that wouldn't hold. But we view, in accounting, we view equity as always equaling assets less liabilities. In other words, everything a firm does affects either itself, assets and liabilities, or equity, the owners. And the five elements of accounting, we've now got revenue. Revenue are increases in assets or decreases in liabilities of a firm that result in increases in equity, other than those relating to contributions from equity investors. Actually, we'll stick to that. So, for example, um, the, uh, and it excludes contributions to equity investors. So if an equity investor puts in a million dollars cash to into a firm, increases cash, which is increases an asset, and it increases equity by a million dollars as well, but it's not revenue because it was a contrib contribution from equity investors. It hasn't added any value. And expenses are, sort of, are the other side of revenue. They're decreases in assets or increase in liabilities. 
revenue is increases in assets or decreases in liability, of a firm that result in decreases in equity, revenue or result in increases in equity, other than those relating to distributions to equity investors. So if we paid a dividend out, our assets would go down, our cash would go down, our equity would go down, but it's not an expense because it's a distribution to equity investors. So that's the five elements of accounting. Revenue and expenses are changes in value. You see, they result in increases or decreases in equity. Changes in value. And the accounting equation, which is the business model underpinning accounting, equity equals assets, less liabilities. And we often can express it as assets equals equity plus liabilities. It's the same thing. And equity equals assets minus liabilities. This is the entity concept, the duality of all transactions. The, the entity concept, the firm, that's the assets and liabilities, is separate to its owners, equity. And the duality is that everything a firm does affects both the firm, assets and liabilities, and the owners, equity the accounting equation. These are all fundamental aspects of accounting that you need to know and remember and understand. Now, equity equals assets minus liabilities, which we could have as assets equals equity plus liabilities. And then we can add in the other two elements of accounting, revenue and expenses. These are changes to equity, as we saw in the definitions. And so we can have equity plus revenue, Revenue are increases in equity minus expenses. Expenses are decreases in equity. So equity plus revenue minus expenses plus liabilities equals assets. That's the fundamental accounting equation. That is the business model underpinning accounting. That's usually the, anyway, that's one way of looking at it. And the revenue and expenses accounts are temporary accounts. They start at zero every year. And then we emptied them out at the end of the year to calculate our profit each year, which we transfer to equity, and then off we go again. Assets, equity, and liabilities, they stay, they're permanent accounts. Revenue expenses are temporary accounts just for a period. So we've got equity equals assets minus liabilities. And then assets equals equity plus revenue minus expenses plus liabilities, the extended fundamental accounting equation, which we often express as assets plus expenses. So in other words, we add the expenses to both sides, equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. Assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. You should memorize that. Just write it down 40 times. It only takes a few minutes. That is the fundamental accounting equation. That is the summary of the business model that underpins accounting. And we often express it this way, assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities, because on the left-hand side of the equal sign, assets and expenses, increases in those are a debit. So an increase in asset, increase in expenses and debit. And on the right-hand side, equity plus revenue plus liabilities, an increase in those is a credit. This is the business model underpinning accounting. We need to be quite clear and crisp on these things. So the business model underlying accounting, but there's also a lot of rules in accounting, a lot of rules. We heard from Marnie that they can change a bit too from time to time. Sometimes we go through periods where they, all the various rules can change a lot, other times a bit slower. But there's a lot of rules in this game of accounting. And the accounting standards are produced by the Australian Accounting Standards Board, ASB, and it adopts the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, um, and uh, adapts into Australia. You'll see in the first footnote in your firm's financial statements, sort of, it's not actually a footnote, it's before the first footnote, it's the, it shows all the policies. You'll see some statements in there that your firm's following 
the um, if it, uh, say if it's an Australian company, the Australian accounting standards, and uh, which is adopting the international financial reporting standards. This is where the accounting standards come from. And the Corporations Act has a whole lot of rules, and uh, and also the enforcement of the accounting standards for companies is in the Corporations Act, plus a range of other rules. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC, also is the primary, um, that's the vehicle that's enforcing the Corporations Act, uh, which also involves enforcing the standards. And the Australian Securities Exchanges, it has a whole lot of rules, and all of our companies are listed. If they're, whatever, if they're listed on the Australian Securities Exchange, then it will need to follow its rules. Then there's the accounting bodies, the Chartered the CPA Australia, the Chartered Accountants Australia New Zealand, Institute of Public Accountants, there's numbers of various accounting bodies. They've also got rules that, that bind their members. So if you're a member of one of these accounting bodies, Armani is a member of, of CANS, the Chartered Accountants Australia New Zealand, she has to follow their rules. And then there's the idea of a reporting entity. If our firms are a reporting entity, then they have to conform to all these accounting standards. There's a lot of rules. And so um, uh, a lot of firms are not reporting entities, and so they don't have to report conform to these rules. But if you are, and all our companies are listed companies, they are all reporting entities. They've got to conform to all these accounting standards and rules. And there's a lot of them, and they can keep changing. Accounting also has a number of principles. And there's numbers of them. We'll be looking at a few key ones. One is the matching principle. We don't want to wait for a firm to finish its life. Some firms can last 100 years to figure out how it's going. We want to know period by period along the way say a year, might be shorter period, but let's just say a year for our firms with their annual reports. And to determine its net income for an accounting period, like a year, a business calculates the expenses involved in earning the revenues of the period and deducts the total expenses from the total revenues earned in that period. That is, it matches the expenses against revenues for that period. So because we want to know the performance of a firm in a period, to calculate the income or the profit, we've got to match the revenue with the expenses. And uh, if we don't do that, we're going to get out of whack in a, in, a, in a particular period. And that's called the matching principle, an important principle in accounting. And another important principle is accrual accounting. Now, this is important. You need to understand this. People who don't know anything about accounting assume accounting is all cash-based. Money's coming in, money's coming out. But if you've got to conform to the rules of accounting, and even if in the accounting standards, you definitely have to use accrual accounting. But even if you don't, a lot of people will do it anyway. A lot of accounting is accrual accounting, not cash. What is accrual accounting? Well, it's we record the transactions and economic events of a firm when their economic substance occurs. And this may quite often be different to when cash changes hands. And uh, so when I catch that bus to the university and I pay my 50 bucks, put it on the card, um, that's not revenue for the firm. When they get the cash, they put it in the till, but it only becomes revenue when I go on each trip and swipe the card and when, when they deliver the service to me and I get the trip. And so the revenue is only recorded every time I catch that bus, not when I give the 50 bucks up front when the cash changes hands. And that's quite common in business, that many transactions are done. The economic substance occurs at a different time to cash. Why is that important? Because it all sort of washes out in the end. Why is that important? Because we want to know the performance of a firm in a period. <laughs> And so we've got to match the revenue and expenses to get the profit. And we record the transactions when their economic substance occurs so that we're getting the revenue and expenses um, 
you know, we can match their when their economic substance occurs in that period as well. Now, a very important thing to understand about accrual accounting, this is for those who are going down the route of understanding what they're learning, is that it requires judgments. When cash changes hands, it's pretty clear cut. When I give the 50 bucks to bus driver, it's very clear cut. But when the economic substance occurs, that can be less clear cut and can require some judgments about when that economic substance occurs. Cash transactions are very clear, but the economic substance occurring of transactions often involves quite a few judgments. What that means is different people can make different judgments. So it introduces quite a bit of subjectivity into accounting. And people can make mistakes when they're making these judgments because, you know, we'll you know, get the judgments wrong, we may not understand things properly or, or whatever. Or we could deliberately try and move the things around a bit to make things look good using the judgments. So that's a cruel accounting. This is important to understand in accounting. So we've had a look at some of the rules of accounting, a little bit of introduction to them. Planning and time management. This is something that came up quite a bit in step one. I'm putting aside time on the weekend to work out how and when I should start attacking the assignments and other assessments. Some people have been putting in a bit of time to plan. They might have done it in the two weeks leading up to term or now. And uh, they, that's one of the signs of people who do well in the unit. They're organised. They figure out when everything's due and all their different subjects and they're planning their way through. My co-worker studies with me and on Monday we were both feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> overwhelmed. You'll feel like that at different times. Many people are feeling it already. So we sat down and worked out what we had to do and when it was due. And we both felt much better about it. So planning, figuring out where everything is, how it's all going to fit in with everything can reduce your stress a lot. So that's a study tip. Planning and time management are important skills in this unit. And people who are good at that will tend to do um, well in the unit. All right, let's have a look at the minute paper now. You can go into Socrative and answer these two questions a number of people may have already. What was the most important thing you learned today and what questions remain unanswered? What was the most important thing you learned today? Shona, Shona Betts, the principles of accounting. That's very general. We're not quite sure. Um, we, we're, we're just looking at the fundamentals. I understand broadly what you're saying, but it's good to be a bit more specific. But that's what we're looking at. These are important things. These are things you'll need these. If you're going to go and work for Evan Edwards or another accounting firm or go into accounting roles or in business generally, these are things you'll need to know. Kim, Kim Turner, I understand accrual accounting a bit more now. Yeah, accrual accounting can be a bit of a tricky thing to get your mind around. If someone asked you, Kim, what do you think accrual accounting is, what would you tell them? Imogen. The rules of accounting and how it can change from time to time. That's interesting, isn't it? Accounting rules that do change. They tend to, a lot of the rules tend to change just gradually. Marnie was sort of alluding to that. But then sometimes we do have periods where they change a lot. And all sorts of rules around things as well. They can be tax and government rules and all sorts of things. We can go through periods. So what's the implications for what we study at uni? If you simply just learn a lot of rules, you know, how we account for this or that or what some tax rule is now. Well, this might be different by the time we start working and they're going to keep changing. So we're going to need to do more than that. You've got to know how all these rules are put together, where to find them, how to keep up with things. And you need to be able to think for yourself, critically look at this material, very much the sort of things we're doing with the KCQs, and to put it in simple words to explain to clients, which is exactly what Marnie was talking about today. Naomi in Bendigo, good on you for putting your location. The meaning of different accounting terminology. Yeah, so particularly those five elements of accounting. Memorise the definitions. Forget the sort of general stuff that you might get if you go and Google it or something. 
or might have learned at high school, learn the actual definitions. They're the actual definitions. They've actually defined <laughs> these items in the accounting standards. And that's what they are. Let's learn those definitions and be very specific. You, you do need to know that they're the building blocks of accounting. Shannon, accrual accounting as I had never heard of it before. So accrual accounting will be new to many people. Many people, it's like a misconception. Many people will think accounting is just cash. If you don't have to conform to all the rules, if you're not a reporting entity, you can keep your accounts just on cash. And some people will do that. But if you are a reporting entity, if you've got to conform to the accounting standards, like all of our firms do in this unit, you, you are required to do accrual accounting. And many other firms will do it anyway, because you want to know the profit and you want to be able to look at things that their economic substance occurs rather than just the cash. The cash is a different story. The cash is important, but we want to know whether we're really adding value in a period. Caitlin in Queensland. Oh, here we go. Kim's that, that transactions are recorded even though cash may not have changed hands yet. I've seen it at my new job, but haven't really understood when it was used before. That's a good answer, Kim. That, uh, that's just on the chat. Put it up there. The, um, yeah, so it's cash may change hands at a different time. It often does to when the economic substance occurs in business. And it underpins a reality of business, which is that business is based on a certain element amount of trust. Without trust, you can't really do much in business. There has to be some trust. We often pay for, like I pay 50 bucks to the bus company and then I catch the trip. Some, it might take me months to do the trip sometimes. I trust them with my $50. You know, they're not going to just go bust or rip me off. Um, and there's a lot of that in business. And when trust falls apart, you know, business becomes impossible or very difficult. So that's good. And Kim, you see it in the business. So you start to see why certain things are recorded in the way they are um, because of accrual accounting. That underpins how we look at accounting. And also you see that we're interested in performance in a period. Engine Wang, what is accrual accounting? So that's another, that's a key thing for a number of people. The principles of accounting, Andrew. More clarity. Andrew from Marie, but more clarity definition about the five elements of accounting and the need to reprogram the way I think about them. That's good, Andrew. Excellent. Just as those students in studying science at um, Harvard, they had a preconception about how the seasons were, <laughs> like a lot of people do. And they just stuck to it, even though they'd studied it. Well, you've just had a look at the five elements of accounting. Chances are that if I ask you in at the, when you graduate, you'll tell me the stuff you thought before you studied accounting. <laughs> you'll tell me the, that stuff. So you've got to reprogram the way you think about them. So how are you going to do that? And uh, those definitions, they're reasonably simple. Once you, you can memorise them reasonably simply and they're, they're not that complicated on the surface, but they, that's what they are. That's what those five elements are. And so you need to repeat them 40 times, memorise them as a starting point to understanding them. So, Andrew, good on you at Marie, but good on you to see that. That's, a, that's an excellent insight. Owners being separate from the business, even when a sole trader. Good insight, Cheryl. That is a key. The entity concept. Think of it as the one good idea of accounting. It seems obvious, but it's actually turned out to be a very powerful idea. And the idea that if everything a firm does affects its owners and itself has proved to be very powerful. Probably since about the 1960s, there's been a growing realisation that businesses affect a lot more than the owners and the business itself. And that's increasingly recognised that it has a lot more impacts. It impacts its employees. It impacts the, uh, its customers and its suppliers. It impacts the environment. It impacts the community in all sorts of ways. It can, its businesses can impact its neighbours. So firms do have a lot more impact than just on themselves and the owners. But accounting doesn't include any of that. It's one of the challenges for accounting going forward is to figure out how to adjust its business model. 
But this is how accounting is and um, at the moment. Patrick, g'day, Patrick. And um, I understand that assets are just not what the business owns, but more of resources that generate revenue and profits. That's excellent insight. So they're a present resource. So memorize the actual definitions too, because they're quite precise and they've been well thought through. It's a present resource. In other words, we've got it now. It's now, it's like those delivery vans of, this, of, of um, Coffee Supreme. They're not, they're a resource. And they're not just what a business owns. Forget about that. That's just, you know, it's pretty unhelpful. It is a little element of it. You've got to control. It's, it, you don't even have to legally own them, but you usually do. You have to control the, those future economic benefits that it has the potential to, to, to um, produce. So it is an element of being an accountant of a firm but asset, but it's not the key thing. Assets are not just what the business owns, that's great, but more they're the present resources that, and this is more precise, that have the potential, the potential to generate future economic resources. It's the potential. They may not. The future, things mightn't work out, you know. Those delivery vans, one of them might sort of blow a tyre and never be used and just be parked somewhere but they have the potential to do it. Um, Christine, is cash deposits considered as an accrual accounting? Cash is an asset. Um, so it's an asset. Um, accrual accounting, um, if the economic substance of a transaction occurs at the same time as cash changes hands, then they're both at the same time. But if they're not, then cash could change hands, but it's not revenue or an expense or can be related to, to those. But if, like when I put the $50 in at the bus, that does go straight into the cash deposits of the bus company. So cash goes up $50. And that's an asset. But what happened at double entry accounting, that's the debit. We know an increase in an asset is a debit. We did it today. You see, you need to know these things. You've got to memorize them first and get used to them. But the cash goes in, that's going to be a debit. Someone's entrusted the firm with the cash. Not entrusted the firm with the cash. The, the firm owes an obligation with that asset to use the asset well. That's the debit. What's the other side? What's the credit? Well, if it's the $50 that I've just swiped on the card, it's not revenue, $50. Remember, an increase in revenue is a credit. It's not that. What is it? It's a liability. It's a liability because we have an obligation. Present, remember, a liability is a present obligation. And it's a present obligation to transfer in the future, to transfer economic resources. So why is it a liability for the bus company? Because it has a present obligation which is not practical ability to avoid, no practical ability to avoid, to take me on bus trips to the tune of $50 worth without me paying for them. I just swipe the card. So that's it's a liability, credit liability. So the cash going in increases an asset, but it's a liability So rather than revenue. So accrual accounting is all in everything. So, But it, uh, the cash is still goes in the bank account. I don't know if that answered it, Christine. You can ask to follow up. Hannah in Rockhampton, that these elements, principles, et cetera, are all important tools to use in accounting. That's good, Hannah. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. They're important. Don't skim over this stuff. You'll need it. And uh, this is the foundations. The accounting equations and how they relate to credits and debits. That's great, Joseph. How people-focused accounting really is. Yes. Interesting, there's Marnie. She thought it was all about numbers when she started and she likes the numbers and there are numbers and she enjoys all that. But it's all about the people. It's about communication. Accounting is about giving advice and uh, you have to understand all the numbers, you have to understand everything and then you, so that's the critical analysis and then you need to be able to communicate. And that's what Marnie was saying. That's good. That's excellent. Um, that's uh, Um, I think we've gone through everyone. Kirsian, a better understanding of the five elements and their relationship 
with the accounting equations. Carolyn, a business needs to know it will be your friend tomorrow. Will you succeed? Economic substance. That's good. We'll just quickly look at the what questions remain unanswered. Andrew, maybe just a few general examples of when a particular type of firm will choose to use the matching principle over accrual accounting. Plus, no, the matching principle and accrual accounting are both consistent. You don't choose to use one or the other. They're underlying principles of uh, accounting that we use. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so they're not inconsistent. Caitlin, what is equity specifically? I like that question. Have a look at the reading. I've put in the readings, um, my definition of equity, which is different to the one in the accounting standards. <laughs> equity has its own personal identity. Why should it just be, it's sort of like a leftover concept, sort of after the assets, less liabilities, that's what's left. Well, equity is more than that. And uh, have a look in the reading. I, I discussed that a little bit. But equity does, uh, uh, does have its own identity. And uh, it's the, um, and, um, but that's not something that's in the definitions of equity as yet. Um, it's, uh, but have a look in the reading. It's a little bit too much to say at this point, at this part of the lecture. Does it matter which way you write the accounting equation? No, as long as it balances, you can move them all around pluses and minuses. Um, and that's what I did a little bit. I shifted them around. You can express it any way you like. The common way of expressing the fundamental accounting equation is assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. The reason for that is the ones on the left increases the debits, ones on the right increases a lot, uh, a credits. If you remember the fundamental equation and remember the ones on the left increases the debits and ones on the right increases the credits, like how hard is that? Um, you've got the fundamentals of double entry accounting. You can go back to that and that will tell you what to do. Why is accounting important in society? That's such a good question, Imogen. It's a shame you've just asked, I've just got to at the end. There's some questions to ask. Is accounting important in society or not? Or is it just something... Most people come at the beginning of the degree, at the beginning of studying accounting, thinking that it's record keeping and, you know, this is going to be so boring. And uh, well, a lot of that's automated now anyway. So you know, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to get the quills and the paper out. There's no books in accounting anymore. It's all, in, it's all computerized. And, and the transactions are often just go in automatically. You know, when you go to a checkout at Coles, one of the key things that, checkout people are doing are uh, entering all the transactions into the accounting system when they swipe everyone in. They're entering it in and it's affecting the inventories, it's the revenue, it's the cash, it's the whole, whole caboodle. So it's all just being sort of automated. But does it, is accounting important in society? Some people are starting to think about that question and uh, uh, the accounting troll quote came up quite a bit in people's step ones where the accounting numbers, I used to think the accounting troll said, I thought that the, um, um, that the, you know, that the accounting numbers just reflect, just reflected reality and told you what's going on. But now I think the accounting troll said that the numbers create reality. <laughs> Interesting. So people are starting to think about that a little bit. So there's some in, in, Questions to ask as we go through, is accounting important in society or not? You know, and we'll be looking at some of those questions as we go. And it's related to understanding what accounting is. And you can see how difficult it can be to change some of our perceptions about things. I mean, it's open. People can have a range of views on all these things, by the way, and people do. And that's all good. But if we've got some preconceived ideas, it's amazing how we just stick with them. And we're discussing all these sorts of things now, but will you remember them tomorrow? Will you remember them in a year's time? Will you remember them in 10 years time? So it's how we're going about the learning. And it's not just understanding, it's also doing the right learning. We've got to remember the, the accounting, the definitions of those five elements of accounting. We've got to know the fundamental accounting equation. We've got to know increases in assets and expenses of debits and increases in equity, revenue and liabilities or credits. We don't know all this stuff, but we've got to, un that's not enough. We've got to understand what these things are. We've got to understand what the elements are. We've got to understand the principles of accrual accounting, 
matching principle we've looked at. We're just, this is just introductory accounting. We're not going into all the technical detail. We're just introducing you to what accounting is. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for your questions. And, uh, yes. um, and uh, bye for now, everyone.